The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. is Policy Watch with Doug Fesher. The post-Watergate reforms of 1974 have altered political campaign funding by defining monetary limitations on contributions. How have these reforms and the creation of soft money transformed today's campaigning? For further insight on how they affect fundraising, campaign spending, and the concept of public financing, Policy Watch welcomes Jeffrey Birnbaum, an award-winning author and columnist for the Washington Post. And now, Doug Besheroff. Jeff Birnbaum, welcome back to Policy Watch. It's actually your third time, so we're delighted. Um, in our last program, uh, we discussed Washington lobbyists, um, and drawing on your long experience in Washington and the fact that you write a column for the Washington Post called In the Loop on K Street. K Street is where the lobbyists are said to uh, uh, inhabit, but they're now all over town. Uh, and you wrote, but I want to talk um, uh, in this show about campaign fundraising. And uh, the starting point is your book, uh, The Money Men, which you wrote a few years ago, but money has apparently become even more important mm -hmm. in politics. As we talk, there are estimates that um, the 2008 presidential election will be the first billion dollar presidential election. Uh, and uh, my impression, we'll explore it um, in the program, is that you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, that it, there's no natural stomping to this, but I'm getting ahead of the story. Um, this all s campaign finance reform had its major impetus, right? Nixon, Richard Nixon, and Watergate. Uh, before coming here today, I Googled suitcase Richard Nixon, that's all, all right? And I came up with the story of $700,000 in one suitcase that made its way from Mexico to the U.S. And people didn't exactly know what to do with this. So, so that gave rise to the post-Watergate 1974 reforms. Tell us a little bit about those reforms, what they were intended to do and how well they did it. Well, it, they were to do away with um, cash. Cash. Actually, most people uh, thinks, uh, think uh, that money to um, members of Congress back then were in bags. Uh, in fact, uh, my research indicates that it was mostly envelopes. Uh, <laughs> but but the, the, the cash uh, uh, exchange was done away with. There, uh, all sorts of new disclosure requirements were, were included, in, including political action committees were um, uh, codified in a way that uh, um, actually allowed them to explode uh, in numbers. Uh, but in any case, uh, f the ability to follow the money so that there were not, uh, money was not under the table, and that um, you could have some idea who was giving how much to whom. That's really what uh, the 1970s uh, campaign finance uh, reforms were all about. And a cap on individual That's right. Limits uh, that were eventually upheld so that uh, uh, there was not the appearance of corruption. Uh, the, the, there were, uh, for the first time, uh, the, even though th there is a, a lot of tension between the First Amendment, the right uh, to, for free speech, and uh, how much, how many limits you could place on the amount of money that you give uh, to candidates because the Supreme Court has also uh, ruled, in effect, uh, that money equals speech. Um, and therefore, putting too many limits on, on it uh, infringes on the First Amendment. But uh, even within that uh, First Amendment right, you can avoid the appearance uh, of corruption by placing limits on the amount of money that can be given by individuals and other entities, including political action committees or PACs, which really are collections, pools of money from individuals that are dispersed for interests, which cannot give money themselves to candidates, such as corporations and labor unions. So one, one purpose was to prevent people with a lot of money or organizations with a lot of money 
from using that in a disproportionate way, whether it's using it in a way that would appear to corrupt the system. Um, the problem with that set of, of changes and even the more recent ones is that I've always thought of money in politics like water running down a mountain. Uh, you could try to dam it, to stop it, to prevent it, but it will always find a way. Um, and that has been the history of campaign finance reforms. Um, as I mentioned in the 70s, the creation of, uh, uh, of political action committees or a pool of money uh, uh, from individuals that, are, that is directed by entities which cannot in and of themselves give money to candidates, such as corporations and labor unions. But they can have their members put money into a political action committee and then from that pool of money give uh, money to candidates. And what's uh, the candidates. theory of why that, why that would be legal? Why does the law allow that to happen? Um, I, I think I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'll give you three, three words that you never hear from people in Washington. I, always I don't know. Uh, I don't. I don't know. The. the I'm not uh, a, a lawyer. It just so. seemed a little bit like laundering money. Well, I've often thought of campaign finance laws as uh, legalized bribery, uh, and I've actually um, written a, a, a story that was and titled that, and I was able to keep my job. So that's all right. Uh, you cannot give money to a member of Congress. Uh, you can't give it to uh, that, a person uh, for personal use, especially if the member of Congress does something in return for that money. That is bribery, uh, and very, very difficult to prove. It's almost impossible. But the system of campaign finance allows individuals to give money to uh, special campaign committees for members of Congress. And if they happen to do what you want them to do, um, uh, as long as they don't do it directly because of that contribution or you can't prove it that way, it's not a bribe at all. Um, and that money can be used to hire if the congressman's husband or wife can be used to well, pay for legal fees? Yes, uh, but those things are questionable. Th that money is mostly goes to get a person reelected in all the ways that, uh, that are important for doing so. Uh, you know, consultants, yard signs, advertising, things like that. Um, uh, but it is a, a peculiar hybrid system where you cannot bribe somebody, but uh, at the same time, uh, political campaigns are privately funded, and therefore they must get their money from uh, political action committees, from individuals, basically. Um, and so the ways in which uh, those two systems can work with each other is uh, a very big business, basically, uh, trying to separate what is legalized bribery from actual bribery. And, and there are other kinds of loopholes, too. Uh, uh, bundling, which is a little bit, whatever the presidential committees are called, the Longhorns or whoever they are. Every, <laughs> every president has one or two of these, in, right? Just, right. Uh, president Bush had uh, rangers, for example. but. What you're referring to are the most important uh, people in the campaign finance system, which are not individual givers of contributions, but the uh, collectors of them, uh, fundraisers. Uh, what's most important, because of the limits you referred to uh, on individual giving, uh, it's not your wallet that is most important, but your Rolodex. If you know a lot of people who can also give money, then that makes you a truly important person uh, in the world of, of campaign fundraising. And that's why large political action committees are very important, because they have a lot more of money to distribute. Then we get the infamous McCain-Feingold bill. Mm -hmm. McCain as in John McCain and so forth. Now that was, that attempted to deal with soft money, right? right? How did that, what did it try to do? Well, in going back to the water coming downstream, <clears throat> the real torrent um, was the ability of um, the political parties to collect unlimited sums <clears throat> um, to help many campaigns um, from these uh, otherwise prohibited sources, corporations, labor unions. Um, <clears throat> they were able to give the political parties 
unlimited amounts of money for, uh, for national advertising, for developing computer databases, for things that didn't help specific candidates, or at least supposedly. That's how uh, it was a loophole that, uh, that got around that, the, uh, the limits that you talk, talked about being um, imposed in the 1970s. Well, um, the McCain-Feingold law uh, closed down the soft money. This is called soft money. Hard money was the amount given directly to candidates' coffers and were limited to what was then, I think, $1,000. Now it's, I think, 2300 Now it's 2300 It's called hard money. Soft money were hundreds of thousands of dollars given by major corporations to the Democratic and Republican parties for the softer purposes, if you're following what I'm saying. And individuals, too. And individuals, uh, wealthy individuals. Um, Left and right. There was, uh, yes, it was... Uh, Democrats were In fact, um, yes, Democrats were especially good at it. Uh, but um, this was seen as seriously corrupting uh, by uh, many uh, voters and eventually a majority of the Congress as uh, pressed um, by John McCain and his Democratic partner, Russell Feingold of Wisconsin. Uh, and they shut down that loophole so that members of Congress um, and candidates for office could no longer solicit these major, these huge contributions um, uh, from labor unions and corporations and other interests. Um, and in fact, the parties could no longer accept these uh, uh, massive contributions. But other things were done to compensate for that disadvantage. Um, the amount of individual contributions was doubled more or less and uh, indexed to inflation. That's why the individual contribution per election went from $1,000 now to $2,300. And, and in fact, the primary is one election and the general is another election, that is correct. so it's actually 4600 That's correct, per person, and you could double that again for couples. Um, and the amounts of money, hard money, because that's the only kind of money that's allowed now, um, to the political parties, state parties and uh, national parties was also increased so that uh, a person now in an, in, uh, an election cycle can give over $100,000 uh, in political contributions, um, which is less than 500000 but is nonetheless a, a good deal of money. And at least the McCain campaign, I don't know, I, I assume it's both, but I don't know for a fact, have now created a fundraising approach that says, uh, we want you to give to this max of 100,000 or whatever, 2,300 to the candidate, X amount for the party, either right. national party, and some for the state party. Right. Th these are called victory funds, loosely speaking, and uh, they each have their own names. And so you can, uh, um, it's actually a, a, an interesting sign of the times that because Obama is such a successful fundraiser, by putting together these roughly $70,000 per person packages of contributions that he's soliciting, he is actually helping the underfunded Democratic National Committee, whereas John McCain, who has been having trouble himself raising money, uh, relatively speaking, he's using the uh, uh, ability, the superior ability of the Republican National Committee to, uh, to get money uh, to his campaign by using these packages. Now, we haven't, we've talked this morning, we never even got to the 527s. What is a 527? Right. Uh, a 527 was also created by McCain-Feingold Law. <clears throat> another, it was another, it is a political committee, um, basically, um, that uh, discloses its contributions to the Internal Revenue Service. So you can get some idea of how much uh, these uh, groups have, but these, this is another way uh, in the river down the mountain theme uh, for large contributions to still play a major role in, uh, in elections. Uh, the soft money can no longer go to the political parties, but they can go to these independent groups which can and will spend large amounts of money um, on advertising, often attack ads, um, against for and against the clients, the, uh, the candidates they, they support. Now, the key legal word there is independent. That's right. And many people think that they're not, these committees on both sides are not that independent. Right. Um, and there are a very elaborate set of rules about how much communication can be uh, had between uh, the candidates' offices and 
527s and other entities. There are all sorts of uh, structures where money, large money, uh, can find its way into uh, the political debate. Um, as long as you don't name a candidate but talk about an issue perhaps, these issue campaigns um, are, are very potent weapons and will be potent weapons. So despite these two waves of reform, uh, there still is uh, large money, um, and maybe because of these waves of reform, I think it's fair to say that there is large money that will play a role um, in this year's election. Yeah, I know we both want to get to the massive amount of money um, coming in, actually to all the candidates right. now, but I, I want to stay with this for just a minute. Um, it's also the case under these reforms that very wealthy candidates have a tremendous advantage. The mayor of New York outspends his rival by just writing his own check, uh, Bloomberg. Uh, Mitt Romney put many millions into his campaign. Hillary Clinton, 10 or more million dollars into her campaign. Uh, that doesn't seem exactly right either. I'm, I'm going to stay away from right and wrong okay. on this one. But I, Odd. Uh, Imbalanced. <laughs> uh, there, there are uh, provisions, I think, in McCain-Feingold that um, allow the limits uh, to, uh, for challengers to millionaire self-contributors uh, to be lifted and so that they are able to get more money uh, from the public and spend more. Uh, so there, there, this, has, this, this is clearly an issue. But it is a, <clears throat> also a reason why both political parties often do uh, recruit millionaires. Um, who can self-finance because um, you don't have to spend as much time raising money and a lot of politicians spend at least a third of their time, sometimes two-thirds of their time uh, on the phone dialing for dollars uh, because money is so important. And, and there are all rules about that. Um, Al Gore couldn't call from his residence or he couldn't call from, from his office. From his office. Actually, he could because there was one designated phone that was the political phone, like the bat phone. And members of Congress leave the Capitol and go to the, either the Republican or the Democratic national headquarters where they're little cubbies, yes. and they make their phone calls. Right. They have uh, donor lists, and they go down them and beg for cash. Now, we've been waiting to talk about this. One fellow who apparently doesn't have to do that so much anymore is named Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And this is because the money's rolling in. Well. The, the fuller story is actually a little more interesting, I think. Um, the real first success story on internet fundraising, which is you simply go online and use your credit card and click your way through, was um, John McCain after the uh, New Hampshire primary in 2000, in which he beat Isn't that George ironic? W. Yeah. Bush. He raised overnight, uh, as I remember it, a million dollars or something very large, if I got that wrong. My, please forgive me, but it was a massive amount of money because uh, of his su surprise success against the front runner. Uh, but Barack Obama is the first candidate to really um, realize the potential of the internet when it comes to fundraising. Uh, he created a movement, I think it's fair to say, that his candidacy is not just support for a politician, uh, but is uh, a very broad uh, movement for change that he sits atop of. He has uh, 1.5 million do uh, contributors, which is several times larger than uh, any previous presidential candidate has ever accumulated. And the potential uh, for starting with that base is so large that the irony here, yet another one, is that he is the first major party presidential candidate to say no to uh, public financing, which is really the, um, the, the goal of all campaign reformers. Public financing mm -hmm. is what mm -hmm. they see as the real answer. But the movement, the anti-Washington, um, uh, the, anti, the, the most serious anti-Washington uh, outsider running for president is the one who is giving a stiff arm to public financing. I, I have two reactions, I must say, to all this. First, this is a great deal of money, and I know Newt Gingrich used to say, 
The problem with campaign finance is there's not enough money in political campaigns. Not mm. that there's too little. Spoken like a true leader of the party. Is there, since I think we're on the road to vast increases in campaign spending, mm -hmm. is that a good thing or a bad thing? Hmm. Um, well, it is. So, um, and I, I don't believe anybody is seriously thinking about uh, limiting the amount of campaign spending overall. Um, except for those people, I shouldn't say that. There is a strong movement to uh, expand uh, public financing. Um, it, there are several states that now use, use uh, public financing. Um, I'm not sure that I agree with the proposition that's, that money equals evil in all things, and certainly in, in, in politics. Um, and certainly the tw twist of the internet puts a whole new spin on this. And I, I, let me just give Barack Obama's spin to be, to be fair to him, um, which is that he believes that what, because he is getting so much money from small donors that he is not really being bought or cannot be accused of being bought by any major interest, uh, which is a form of public financing. Now, I, I think that, that was, that's an argument made up after the fact, uh, that uh, because he can raise so much more, he'd be a very bad politician indeed not to take advantage of that. Uh, nonetheless, that is his argument. But because politicians can raise so much money uh, in relatively small uh, dollops, I think that the, we are uh, doomed uh, to not have campaign finance reform that squashes down the amount of money uh, in any way. There are most uh, of, of uh, reformers uh, who uh, fall short of public financing as a goal uh, look for um, enhanced disclosure of one kind or another so that at least we know where all the money is coming from. Yeah, my question wasn't so much about Obama oh. as just all this money. It, there's something, I must say, attractive about the British system. I think it's an eight-week campaign. You can't spend money before that. And it, um, I can just picture three months of wall-to-wall -wall TV commercials and, um, and so forth. So I, I suppose I was reacting to the amount of money on both sides, not so much on you know, how it was collected or whatever. This could be a turning point in what American elections look like. Right. I think there, um, there, there may be a backlash. That's how these uh, reforms come about. Um, if, there's, if Obama swamps McCain, for example, uh, because he has so much more money, um, there, will be, there will be questions about that. I think I, I agree. Uh, and especially because there's such an, an anti-Washington feeling out there, um, uh, money will be seen at the heart of it. As to, as, as to exactly where it goes, though, I, I'm, uh, I really can't guess. Yeah. Well, my bet, you're the pro, but my bet is, as you say about water, finding its, you know, its way down the mountain, this, this is here to stay. And we should just invest in electioneering corporations or firms <laughs> because that's the future. <laughs> I think that may be so. Well, you've been a wonderful guest. Thank you. Thank you again. Jeff Birnbaum, our pleasure. And now let's turn to the audience for questions for our guest. Hi, I'm Vicki Frank. I wanted to ask you, and I guess this is a little bit of a follow-up, um, you've uh, seen a lot of lobbies, lobbyists uh, in the past. What would you say would be one of some of the more effective ones in terms of, uh, in your estimation, in terms of you know, being most successful at advancing their agenda, and why? Well, I, I would, thank you for that question. I uh, would answer it not in a, a, a personal sense, that is, who is the most important lobbyist, one person. I think you have to look at lobbying groups, um, and that would be the best way to assess it. And, uh, for I actually did a um, oversaw a poll for Fortune magazine where I worked previously uh, for several years, and uh, AARP uh, when uh, came out on top when you asked insiders to the process in Washington, uh, members of Congress and their staffs and other lobbying groups, um, 
And interestingly enough, they came out uh, most of the time as number one, because, not because of money. The, the AARP has no political action committee, makes no contributions whatsoever. <clears throat> its strength is in numbers. Uh, it now has about 40 million members. Uh, and a good number of those members are actually trained by ARP to uh, interact with their elected officials. And um, uh, if people want, and, and older Americans uh, vote in higher proportion than any other demographic group. And there are three things that lawmakers care most about. I'm sure you've taught this many times, Professor. They are uh, getting reelected, getting reelected and getting reelected. And so if members of Congress want to get reelected, they do not want to cross anyone with as large a block of voters in their districts and states as AARP. And thank you very much, Jeff Birnbaum. Thank you for being with us again, and come back soon. Thank you so much. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS.